Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, I'm sorry. I should have done these three. Um, Europe prior to war, three parts before I did the this one, Outbreak of World War One, which I just reacted to. But I will post these three first, and, and then I'll post that one. Let's go. Part one. If you aren't ready to learn about World War One, there's the door. This is a long journey. Lot of uh, episodes. Great time to join the channel. Hit the subscribe button. Original link to the video, top of the description. Did I say that? Right below that, link to the Discord. Click on the link. It'll send you right over there. Don't be shy. All right? We're nice, usually. Sometimes. Sort of. Um, yeah. All right. Love to have you. Uh, and under that, uh, link to my second channel, which I'm actually kind of transitioning out of because I, I one of my bigger mistakes, I think, um, was, was changing into two channels. I, I, I want to be mainly history but more than just history and uh you know just mcjibbin instead of mcjibbin and mr mcjibbin so i'm trying to kind of transition the videos over to this one and then just have one channel and go at it that's just decision i i'm solid on and uh, i'm gonna do let's start my name is indy Nidal, bones away and welcome to our new channel bones away channel the great war this show follows world war one from july 20 28th, 1914 to November 11th, 1918, week by week, exactly 100 years later. But in order for the initial weeks of the war to make more sense, we're doing these prelude to war episodes to give you a little background. All here on our new channel, The Great War. Let's do it. Do you know what happened 100 years ago last month? On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. This was the little match that ignited the bonfire of the First World War. Now, it took a full month after the assassination for war to be declared. And on July 28, 2014, it is exactly 100 years since the beginning of World War I or the Great War, as it was called, or even the war to end all wars. And unlike pretty much every other World War I show ever, we're going to ignore Franz Ferdinand for the moment and talk about some other stuff. Right. The consequences of the Great War were massive and affected pretty much every person in every country on Earth. Sorry, guys. I, I just don't like this setup I have right here. I'm, I'm just going to make it like that and then full screen it. Okay. Four great empires ceased to exist. A bunch of new nations saw the light of day and the explosive growth of an extraordinary number of social movements, such as internationalism or fascism, changed the world's political landscape forever. Just in terms of technology, the Great War moved the world ahead by leaps and bounds. Cars and planes had existed prior to the war, but by 1918, we had tanks and diesel fuel, bombers and fighters, and long- Imagine flying in those first planes. I'm not afraid of flying, but I definitely don't enjoy it. And to fly in one of the first kind of prototype planes, or even like the World War I planes, what would... Large planes ready to be converted into the first airliners. And the tragedies were enormous. Although completely accurate records are impossible, the war caused close to 40 million casualties, killed or wounded, including nearly 10 million dead soldiers, in a world whose population was only a quarter of what it is now. But why the Great War? Why start it? Why go through with it? There had certainly been enough talk about a European war during the early parts of the 20th century. Sometimes romantically, such as when military leaders who'd never actually seen combat thought about coming home covered in glory. But most often, it was talked about as a necessity. And this was driven by waves of revolutionary sentiment, strikes and violent labor unrest, and above all, feverish nationalism, which together came to steer the course of Europe in the early 20th century. Now we'll go into that in detail week by week. Think about a German Europe, not today, but a hundred years ago. It's a theme that was certainly tossed around back then, most spectacularly in the bestseller Mittel Europa. And I don't mean the Nazi kind of German Europe, but a true German influenced and culturally and politically dominated Europe. You see, Prussia, and then a unified Germany, had emerged as the leading power in Europe after beating France under Bismarck in 1870. Otto! There he is, in the white. He won, and things had just rolled on after beating France under Bismarck in 1871, and things had just rolled on since then. By 1914, Berlin was the cultural capital of Europe, where you went if you wanted to study anything serious. 
if Germany won World War One, what what do you guys think? Would the world be better, worse? I get you think World War Two would ever happen? Obviously, I would think Hitler would never come to power, but I'm not sure the other ramifications. Words like Hertz, Rentgen, Mach, and Diesel all come from this period. And British cabinet ministers, Russian Bolsheviks, they'd all studied in Germany, which had even replaced England as the industrial giant of Europe. Many people, not just German, dreamed of a German Europe, or at least a multinational German Commonwealth. Now, this Commonwealth could protect itself from England or the United States, could bring in raw materials from France and Scandinavia, would have its own coal and steel production, and hopefully even colonies in North Africa or in the Middle East where there was oil. It was an impressive dream, and it wasn't that far-fetched, especially when you think about what was going on outside of Europe at the time. See. Africa and India were basically being run from Europe. China was ready to collapse. The Ottoman Empire looked ready to collapse. What Germany really needed to do to succeed was to work with its German-speaking neighbor to the south. Germany had been allied with Austria since 1879. There was, though, a big problem with the Austro-Hungarian Empire because it was really shaky. Now, there are several reasons for this, but one big one that I'm going to mention right here, Austria had a serious mismanagement problem. Actually, when you look at the world around it, Austria was an anachronism. The rest of Europe was going through a huge age of nationalism, but in Austria, there were 15 different versions of the national anthem. Franz Joseph, the emperor, had been on the throne since 1848, and he was 84 years old. And he, too, was very out of place in modern Europe. And he made very questionable decisions. In 1908, for example, he made the decision to annex Bosnia and Herzegovina, which were nominally part of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this basically pissed everyone off, especially the Ottoman Empire. There were protests from all of the great empires, but especially noisy protests from Bosnia's neighbor, Serbia. And I don't basically pissed everyone off, Herzegovina, which were nominally part of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this basically pissed everyone off, Herzegovina. Wait, for example, he made the decision to annex Bosnia. In 1908, for example, he made the decision to annex Bosnia and Herzegovina, which were nominally part of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this basically pissed everyone off, especially the Ottoman Empire. There were protests from all of the great empires, but especially noisy protests from Bosnia's neighbor, Serbia. And I don't know if it's quite possible for me to express just how much anti-Austrian sentiment there was among the Slavic nations and the peoples of the Balkans. Now, looking back, you might have thought Vienna would have said, okay, you guys can have a sort of pan-Slavic nation under Vienna, which might have cooled things off a bit, but they didn't do that. What they did instead was nothing at all. You see, for years, Vienna had been trying to control its minority nations by basically paying them off, to the extent that they had no money left for things like the army. Austria spent less money on its army than England did, even though the Austrian army was ten times the size. So they couldn't afford to keep trying to buy them off, which didn't work out anyway. So Vienna basically did nothing and hoped there would be no catastrophic events. That didn't work out so good. Now, does this sound really complicated? Well, it is. There hadn't been a real European war in over 40 years, war being kept at bay by a complicated and constantly shifting system of alliances. Franco-Prussian? Now, you should look it up yourself because it's really interesting, but here's the basics. Germany and Austria-Hungary were two-thirds of the Triple Alliance, right? Italy being the third part at the time, but nobody really counted on them to help out in case of a war. Germany and France... Or Italy. France had historically been at odds with each other, but even more so after Prussia walked all over France in the Franco-Prussian War. France and England were allied, but it turned out that in the early 20th century, there were French contingency plans afoot to invade England, and vice versa. So, hmm? What? Sense in the Franco-Prussian War. France and England were allied, but it turned out that in the early 20th century, there were French contingency plans afoot to invade England. It's so funny, something someone mentioned in one of the comments of another World War I video, how the USA, like you, you always think of the USA and Great Britain like, like this, uh, obviously not in the beginning, well, in the very beginning. Um, but, you know, at this time, prior to World War I, the, the, I don't know enough about the relationship exactly, but they they were much less friendly, and so 
you you always just think like oh the uk is in trouble or going to war the us is going to back them or vice versa but you know back then it was a much different situation and vice versa so go figure when bismarck had run germany he had cultivated russian friendship but that was long gone much of the german elite now openly looked down on russia who allied herself with france when german industrial and military power really got going and the triple entente between england france and russia became official in 1907 the german empire was friendly with the ottoman empire and a true russian nightmare would be the germans in charge of the dardanelles through which russia sent up to 90 percent of her wheat exports russia supported serbia and all of the slavic peoples which meant they were banging heads with both Aust sorry i never realized there was a double straight you had to go through to get from the uh, G from the aegean right mediterranean the aegean to the uh that is the aegean right uh, anyways, from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. Russia supported Serbia and all of the Slavic peoples, which meant they were banging heads with both Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. And everybody, everybody was worried about another Balkan explosion. <sighs> That's almost it, but not quite. Before I go, I'd like to mention the unique case of Germany and Great Britain. Now, the Germans and the English admired each other culturally, industrially, and militarily. Germany especially admired England's vast overseas empire and her navy, the greatest the world had ever seen. And many Germans were convinced that the British Navy was the key to her success, her power, and her empire. Sorry, I had to turn the Discord pings off. They were distracting me. All right, I'm ready, though. Now, I'm going to quote historian Norman Stone. The last thing Germany needed was a problem with Great Britain, and the greatest mistake of the 20th century was made when Germany built a navy designed to attack her. Pretty heavy words, but think about it. The Kaiser, who occasionally ruled Germany by decree, totally ignoring the fact that the German people did not want war with anybody and admired and respected the British, built a navy. A navy built for only one purpose. The... the... Pretty heavy words, but think about it. The Kaiser, who occasionally ruled Germany by decree, totally ignoring the fact that the German people did not want war with anybody and admired and respected the British, built a navy. Okay. I, I, I thought they said the Kaiser admired the British. Maybe his father, but I, I'm pretty sure Wilhelm did not. And so the German people sort of admired them, but imagine if they, they were a... Um, we're a team like Germany and and UK. A navy built for only one purpose. I feel like to they'd be challenge Britain. Winston Churchill, at the time Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty, suggested a mutual pause in naval building, reasoning that for the British Empire, a powerful navy was a necessity, but for the German Empire, a luxury. But Kaiser Wilhelm would not have it, and he built up the German navy. That navy took a third of the German defense budget, which meant that Germany could not afford a two-front war against France and Russia if such a thing were to happen. And it also meant that there were a bunch of giant battleships sitting in harbors, thumbing their noses at England. Now, there was substantial naval warfare, especially submarine war. You really want to spend 30%, did he say, of his military budget on a navy? To challenge a nation that is, even if you put 100% of your budget into the Navy, I feel like still wouldn't, or 50%, still wouldn't reach up to the just the history that they have with the Navy and the expertise and, and the great ships they have. You're really going to spend 30% of your budget to, to do that when your main threats are going to be on land? Warfare between England and Germany during the war, but... These battleships didn't do anything. They just sat there taking up space the entire war until their crews finally mutinied. They had much more armor than British ships and they were really impressive, but they just sat there mocking England, whose response was to outbuild the German Navy two to one and make further defensive arrangements with France and Russia. That was interesting, right? Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but come back next time to see what was going on in Serbia, Italy, and other sunny places with long cultural histories. Don't forget to subscribe to get each new episode. And also, this show is available in German and Polish. So if you or your friends want to watch it, but English isn't your first language, links to those channels are below. I like to learn German, yet I, I say that about a lot of languages and end up never doing it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll like stream it. I got some German viewers can help me out.
awesome watching part two. I should just do it right now. All right, I am going to separate it into a separate video, so I'll do part two right after this. I enjoyed that. Learned a lot. See you next time.